Now, if you will open your Bible with me, we come again this evening to the 26th chapter of Matthew and to the gospel record of Simon Peter's disowning of Christ. You will be well aware, of course, that this is certainly one of the saddest stories in the Bible, full of pathos and tragedy, and ending at the close of chapter 26 with Peter's bitter tears and the deed done and unable to be undone. It is a story of almost unrelieved tragedy. But I'm sure that it's not given to us in Scripture to depress us or to discourage us. I'm sure that it may well indeed be for the reverse reason. We have to ask the question, how did this account come to be here? Because it seems as if Peter himself was alone for some at least of this time, apart from those who were his inquisitors. You also were with him. And since we know that a considerable amount of the material in the first three Gospels comes from Peter's lips, it seems highly likely that it is Peter himself who was concerned that the whole truth about him should be recorded for subsequent generations in the gospel record. Perhaps with the view that when Jesus initially said to him, you are Simon, you shall be Cephas, which means a rock, which is also what Peter means. When he said that to him, he was recognizing the poor, unlikely, unshapely material that was in the Savior's hands when he purposed to take him and make him not only into a man who would be lifted up from such miry clay and out of such a fearful pit and have his feet set on a rock, but become a figure of unusual usefulness in the church of Jesus Christ and a leader to whom so many looked. When Jesus said way back in Matthew 16, You are Simon, and on this rock I will build my church. He may well have had something of this in mind. And therefore, I think the outcome of our study of Peter's denial of Jesus should not be to send us away discouraged, but rather to hearten us and to bring us to say, recognizing so much of Peter in ourselves as we read it in Scripture, and don't we all of us so often feel that there is so much of Simon Peter his instability, his unpredictability, his self-will. There is so much of it in ourselves. And to be able to say if the grace of God can make such a man out of such a mess, by the same grace he can do it for me. But nonetheless, we dare not, for the very same reasons, 
skip over the story of Peter's denial because it is intended by God to be at one and the same time a means of heartening us and a means of warning us. And in Peter's two letters at the end of the New Testament, you get a marrying of these two things so often together. Alfred Plummer, the great New Testament scholar, summarized it perhaps best when he said, it is given to us, this story, that is the story of Peter's denial. It is given to us that all may fear, that none may presume, and that all may hope, that all may fear, none may presume, and all may hope. Let me just introduce this whole study of Peter's collapse, for that's what it is, by saying to you that in the context of our study of Matthew's gospel, of course, we would have to realize that Peter's spiritual collapse was not a sudden thing or a total surprise. By that I mean it didn't come out of the blue. It was something which probably had been building up for years. And as a general principle, it's true, of course, that as spiritual growth and progress is gradual, so spiritual decline and collapse is generally speaking gradual. Something has been going on, as it were, in secret, probably, for a long time. You could see instances of it, of course, in the spirit that we had detected in Matthew 16 in that moment of climax at Caesarea Philippi when Peter confesses Christ, and there is clearly a great crossroads in Jesus' ministry. And uh, Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who cries out, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father has revealed it to you. You are Simon, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But scarcely has he got the words out than Peter is beginning to listen further to Jesus, taking him further on, you see, into the next stage of the revelation of his purposes when he began to tell them how he must suffer many things and be crucified and the third day rise again. And Peter then, as it were, begins to take Jesus. And you can almost see him taking him aside. I don't know whether he did it quietly or publicly, but I do know that he was taking Jesus aside because he began to believe that he understood more about God's purpose and plan of salvation than Simon Peter or than Jesus. And Peter begins to lecture to Jesus. Lord, he says, this must be far from you. You must stop thinking this way. And then he begins to tell him how suffering is alien to Messiahship, you know. Do you ever, let me pause, do you ever find yourself inclined to give God a lecture about the way He really ought to be ordering your life and ways and the things that He ought to be doing and the priorities that He really ought to have in your situation? Because it was a mark of something in Simon Peter that is really very serious. I think basically it was a refusal of the cross. It was an uncrucified self that was increasingly apparent in Simon Peter as one of his biggest problems. 
And that was something that gradually became a feature more and more of his life. I remember reading years ago of a terrible flood that overtook a village in a remote area of France. Uh, People suddenly one night uh, awoke in the middle of the night and heard what sounded like the torrent of rivers flowing down the mountainside and before long engulfing their entire village and homes were swept away and people were drowned and it was a major and horrifying disaster. And then it was discovered that actually the thing had not happened as suddenly as all the inhabitants thought. Because when they went up to the reservoir at the height of the mountain range and began to examine it, they found that there was an area of the concrete structure that had been being eroded away probably for more than two years. And what had happened is that gradually the hole had grown larger and larger on the outside until it had penetrated right through and suddenly the whole structure gave under the weight of the water. And there is much spiritual collapse that follows that same pattern. Many, many trees that come hurtling down in a fierce and sudden gale have been rotting away inside for years. And Simon Peter's spiritual collapse was like that. And it often can be so. The simple fact is, you see, my Christian brothers and sisters, there is not one of us here in this church this evening who is standing still. We are all either going on or going back. And that's why it's so important when we come to a story like this, and I hope we will be encouraged to believe that God is so well able to restore the Simon Peters in the modern world, it's so important for us to recognize what I remember one of the greatest saints of the Free Church of Scotland saying to us when I was in his home in Dingwall one time of the Strathpeffer Convention that some of you may know about. Duncan Leach, who was one of the godliest men you could ever meet, was listening to someone who had been telling the marvelous story of how God had lifted them up from disaster and from collapse and from every possible kind of extraordinary despair. And the particular individual had fallen in a thousand ways. And someone in the company said, we were sitting around the fire, you know, one of these occasions you would forget easily if it weren't for something that came like an arrow from God, as it did to me. And someone said, what a glorious thing to be restored like that. And Duncan Leach quietly said, but it's an even more glorious thing to be kept. And that's why Simon Peter is so important. We need to be saying all along, Lord, teach me what it is to be kept. Now let me just point out to you, first of all, Jesus' prediction or prophecy, or prophecies in plural really in verses 31 to 35 about Peter's denial. You'll notice in verses 31 and 32 that there are actually three prophecies, one of them 
is a quotation from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 13, verse 7. And the other two are prophecies of Jesus that he makes himself. Notice the prophecy of Zechariah. It makes clear that Jesus is referring as a sign of what is going to happen to himself and to the disciples of something that God is doing in the process of our redemption. The reference from Zechariah uh, says, I will strike the shepherd. And it is, of course, God who is being referred to as the I. It is God who in his purpose of bringing the judgment that really belongs to the sinner upon the shepherd of his people, my own familiar friend, he describes him as. And God is going to achieve the redemption of his people by smiting the shepherd and bringing upon him his judgment, and, he says, the sheep of the flock will be scattered. What he is making clear, of course, is that in all that is happening, and it's one of the things that is manifest and apparent through these chapters 26 and 27, is that Jesus is aware of a sovereign hand of the living God upon every moment and incident of what is happening to him. He recognizes that it is God who is in control of this whole situation. He is fulfilling his purposes revealed in Scripture and centered in Jesus Christ. He is the one who has been pleased to bruise him, to make his soul an offering for sin. And it is this God whose plans are now being unfolded. Now, at that time, Zechariah prophesies, when the shepherd is smitten in judgment for our salvation, the sheep will be scattered. Now, Jesus takes this same theme up again in John 16:32. A time is coming and is now come when you will be scattered, every one to his own home. You will leave me alone. We saw something of the implication of that this morning. But the fulfillment of this prophecy applied to the disciples didn't have long to wait. You notice in verse 56 of this same chapter of Matthew, it is fulfilled. This has all taken place, Jesus says, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. But Jesus prefaces his quotation from Zechariah with prophecies of his own. You notice how he makes that prophecy more specific in two ways. In verse uh, 31, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And then he tells them, and you notice again how assured he is that every instant, every step of the way is under the sovereign hand of God. After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But what is going to happen before that is that the sheep of the flock will be scattered. This very night, he says, you will all fall away on account of me. The word fall away really means to be ensnared or trapped or brought down. And we might ask, by whom? By whom will they be ensnared? Who is going to set a trap 
for these disciples as God works out the salvation of his people. Who is going to set this trap for them? Well, there is no question, of course, who will set the trap. It is Satan himself. He is going to ensnare them. And, of course, Jesus is warning them about the same thing in Gethsemane when he says, watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. He's warning them against the very possibility that they might find themselves in this ensnarement, caught by this trap. And the terrible tragedy is, you see, that Peter thought he was above all this. He thought this would never happen to him. It's very significant that one of his repeated notes when he's writing his letters to the dispersed believers in the church is to say to them, Beware of the evil one who roars around like a lion, longing to devour you. Be watchful, he says. And you can almost hear him adding under his breath, because I thought I didn't need to. Now, Jesus therefore says to them, This very night you are all going to fall away on account of me. Now, again, very interestingly, from verse 35, uh, verse 33, rather, to verse 35, Jesus has to listen to Peter once more saying to him, Now, now, you've got it all wrong. And basically, you get this uncrucified self coming out again. You notice what he says. Put it into our own kind of tongue. And you would say this. Peter says to him, Lord, Lord, even if everybody else falls away, gets ensnared on account of you, you can rely on me. Not me. I am the one who will be the great exception. I don't have a great deal of confidence in these other fellows here gathered around you, Lord. You may be right about them, but you're not right about me. You can rely on Simon Peter. Listen to what he says, how he puts it. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That sort of thing will never happen to me. And then in verse 34, Jesus makes the prediction more specific still. Not just the day, this very night, but now the very time. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Can you sense Jesus almost pleading with the man and with the others around him? He sees the danger before them. They don't see it themselves. They're like a bunch of blind men. And he says, I tell you the truth. That's Jesus always wanting to press something upon people. He says, I tell you the truth. This very night before the cock crows. Now the cock crowed, of course, at dawn. And he says, before... The cock crows. You will disown me. Now he goes even further. Not just disown me, but disown me three times. And again, Peter answers him in verse 35. It's really quite remarkable, you know. This is Peter disagreeing with Jesus again. And he says, you really don't understand, Lord, he says. Even if I had to die with you, I will never disown you. Now, don't don't let's be hard on Peter because... uh, 
all the other disciples said the same. Trouble was that Peter is their spokesman. And uh, let me just point out to you that Matthew is careful to tell us that the rest were exactly like Peter. And all of them were living in this world of illusion. The thing that they needed to hear, of course, was the warning of the apostle, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I guess there must have been people who shared Peter's spirit there in Corinth. And Paul says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now let's turn over and see how the prophecy is fulfilled in chapter 26, verse 69. Do you notice, incidentally, that the godless world around him, which is not only abusing Jesus and insulting and injuring him in verse 68, but they are also dismissing him as a prophet. Notice that. They struck him with their fists, others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Now, the world dismisses him as a prophet. And Simon Peter was doing exactly the same thing. Now, have a care, will you? If you're known as somebody who stands four square on Holy Scripture, you believe every word of it, you stand by everything that it says, lest you may be doing precisely what the world does with the word of Jesus Christ, that is, dismisses it. Because you're disobeying it. And Simon Peter was doing precisely that. Just how accurate the prophecy and prediction was we are about to see. I suppose, you know, when you come to these denials of Jesus by Peter, you really need to ask, why did he deny him at all? Have you ever wondered about that? Why did he deny him? Because, you know, it does not seem as if the authorities were after Peter or any of the other disciple band, for that matter. Do you remember we read this morning how Peter had stretched out his hand, taken his sword, and cut off the high priest's servant's ear? Now, the amazing thing was there was no comeback on that. Nobody arrested him for doing that. They didn't pursue him. There's no evidence that the disciples, in other words, were in some danger. We don't know from the various things that are said about Simon Peter by the girls who were there or by others that they were threatening to turn him in. To whom would they have done that? Their whole interest was in Jesus. And I think it may be that he had become absorbed with the whole notion of self centeredness, self-preservation, and self-interest, that that was what was the, at the root of it all. Self-preservation can take all kinds of forms, of course, can't it? Preserving my own interests, preserving my own plans, preserving my own preferences and priorities. I know exactly what I want, and by hook or by crook, I'll have it. Now look at the first denial with me. We don't need to spend long on these. But you'll notice 
they go in, in pairs of verses from verse 6 to 9. 6 to 9 and 70 is the first denial, and it comes after the servant girl came to Peter sitting in the courtyard. You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. And he feigns ignorance. He feigns not knowing what she's talking about. Do you notice? He says, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Now that, of course, allowed the diabolical foot of deception in the door. The Scripture would say Satan immediately got a foothold in Peter's life at that point because he said, feigning deception, I don't know what you're talking about. You know the kind of thing that we will do sometimes to preserve ourselves when there is something embarrassing like this arises? I don't know what you're talking about, we say. But you know, it did allow Satan's foot in the door, and then things began to develop and get worse. No wonder Walter Scott says, do you remember Scott's memorable words in Marmion? Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Now, you know that at its simplest level, don't you? You know that as we say, one lie leads to another. You cannot enter into this whole world of deception and pretense without it multiplying itself until some great ogre appears before you. And it was so with Simon. Notice the second time in verses 71 and 72. Another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath I don't know the man. I guess these words rang in Simon Peter's mind and heart for an age afterwards. But you notice the bit about the oath. That's what's new. An oath for a Jew would be calling upon God to bear witness of the truth of what he was saying. So he's been calling upon God to substantiate his lie and saying that he was detaching, distancing himself from Jesus Christ. I don't know him. Now, that detachment, that distance was also a progressive thing. But we are not at the end of it yet. Look at the third of these in verses 73 and 74. Surely you are one of them. Those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. He came from the north, you see. Now we could imagine the very same thing here in Scotland. He came from the far north and they listened to him and said, Easy to tell where he comes from. His accent is giving him away. And Peter in verse 74 began then to reach the nadir. Don't you sometimes think it's a sheer mystery that the naked judgment of God did not come from an opened heaven upon him then? He began to call down curses on himself. Now, the word that Matthew uses implies the whole idea of the anathema that was brought down upon him. Somebody was anathema, cast out from God forever. He was really saying, may God curse me. Now that's, that's an eternal thing he's speaking about. May God curse me if I am telling a lie. 
and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And at that very moment a cock crowed, and Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Well, now we know that that was the beginning of Peter's repentance. And he gradually was brought by the grace and amazing mercy of God back to the place where Jesus met with him, you remember, by the lakeside, restored him, drew him to himself, commissioned him for service. And then when the book of Acts begins to get underway, it is Simon Peter who is there proclaiming the matchless riches of Jesus Christ. But I say to you again, my dear friends, in the words of my friend Duncan Leach, it's better to be kept. And Peter tells us how we may be kept. At the end of the last letter he ever wrote, he said, My beloved, you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the only way to avoid what happened to me. Grow in grace so that there may be more and more of Christ and less and less of self. May God encourage us to go out and live like that. Let's pray together. Our Father, we humbly cry to you that you would come and work within our lives and teach us this evening that we may be men and women who by your grace are kept. We ask it for the sake of your name. Amen.